Good morning. Welcome to St. Paul's Online. Glad that you've joined us today. <clears throat> if you're uh, if you if you're watching with us, I'd appreciate if you could uh, drop uh, a hello, uh, say hi to people in the feed. Also, uh, share this feed on your Facebook wall. We'd love to let people know about what God is doing here at St. Paul's and have them join us uh, for this worship time together. <clears throat> a few a few announcements before we get started. Uh, the Wednesday of Holy Week. So it'll be the last day of March, which I believe is uh, the 30th or the 31st, one of the two. Uh, the 31st of March, Wednesday, March 31st, we will have an online uh, virtual meal together as a church family. We will uh, get those details out to you uh, but uh, soon, but at 6.30 p.m. on March 31st, uh, we would like everybody to you know, make a meal at home and join us it, kind of in lieu. We've been delivering uh, meals every Wednesday through Lent uh, for our seniors, and we want to uh, end our Lenten meal season with us sharing a meal all online. So we'd love for you to join us for that. Uh, you, you, everyone will do it in the safety of their home. If you, uh, you want to gather with people you've been uh, hanging out with during the pandemic, you're welcome to do that. Uh, we will jump on Zoom, and then uh, depending on how many people sign up, we'll break out in the different rooms uh, to uh, just share together uh, what's going on in our lives for, for an hour. So from 6.30 to 7.30, we'd love for you to join us for that and uh, take part in that on, a Wednesday, on that Wednesday evening. And we have our junior youth group that will be meeting tonight on Zoom. Um, as of this recording, it looks like the um, weather will still be too cold for us to meet outside. Possibly in the next couple of times we meet, uh, we'll be back outside, but I'll let you know about that. And if you're a senior youth group, please see Jeff about uh, your meeting schedule and uh, connect with him about that. And so with that, we have a very special uh, prelude for us today from our children's choir. Uh, please enjoy. Drive on the Susie, 
Good job, Kids Choir. Uh, thank you for that, uh, all that participated. Uh, if your child wants to be on uh, our Kids Choir, they meet every Thursday night at 7.30 uh, with Emily on Zoom. And so you see they, they're producing good music for us and they're having lots of fun uh, doing it. My kids, my kids look forward to, to choir and getting on there. So uh, it'd be a great habit to create if you have a, a kid. Um, join us for that. Um, join me now in our call to worship. Come, let us worship and bow down. Come, let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For the Lord is our God, and we are his people. Listen to God's voice. The Lord is a great God above all others. We will listen and follow God's way. Join me in singing Rescuer. You are not hidden. There's never been a moment you were forgotten. You are not hopeless. Though you have been broken, your innocence stolen. morning of St. Paul's, please join me in prayer. Lord Jesus, you spent 40 days alone with tempting and inviting thoughts, which could so easily have distracted you from your mission, your vision. Yet you emerged stronger and more focused on all that had to be done, despite a time constraint that to our eyes would have seemed hopeless. We too live in stressful times, Demands are made of us that leave so little time for important things. We are easily distracted by the chaos in our lives. We listen to the voices of this world 
and sometimes ignore the one who endured all of this and so much more, and yet emerge triumphant so that we might not have to suffer. Forgive us, Father, when we get distracted from our task. Forgive us those times when we try to be all things to everyone and fail to be anything to anyone. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. It's like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned. In keeping them there is great reward. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. Lord, my rock, my redeemer. Amen. We're now going to go to a time of prayer. If you have any prayer concern at all, please drop it in our feed below. We'd love to pray for you um, and include that in our email that goes out each and every week uh, for prayer. Let us now go before God in prayer. Faithful God of love, you bless us with your servant son so that we might know how to serve your people with justice and mercy. We gather the needs of ourselves and others and offer them to you in faith and love, seeking to be strengthened to meet them. God, we lift up the concerns of our church. God, we come before you now. We lift up all those who have need, um, who have wants, who have burdens and stresses of life. God, we come before you. Uh, there's so many in our midst, so many that come to mind uh, who are struggling with cancer. God, we lift up um, Tim to you, Elena's friend. We, we, we give him to you. God, we pray for, for healing over his body. We pray for uh, Becky's mom as she continues to go through treatments. God, we pray for strength for her. We pray for encouragement for their family. God, we pray for Elijah. God, we thank you for uh, some success he's having. And God, but we pray for uh, those down times. We pray for continued eradication of, of that cancer. God, we pray for um, Brian Bush, who's dealing with cancer, and Peter Moore, and 
and God, all those uh, who we who we we know uh, intimately who are dealing with this evil disease. We think of uh, the Taglietta family as Stephanie walks through uh, cancer treatments. God, we just pray for healing over them. God, we pray for uh, just peace that passes all understanding for their families. God, those who are suffering with chronic illness, uh, God, specifically, we want to pray uh, for Nicole and Mary Ann as they deal with uh, just lupus and the ongoing and Shannon and the ongoing uh, struggles that come with uh, chronic illness such as lupus. God, we pray for relief for them today. We pray for strength. God, we pray for those who are just struggling with this pandemic still, God, who are just uh, losing energy, losing uh, sleep, uh, just stressed out about things. Uh, God, continue to help us to to stay strong with uh, protocols and, and God, give us energy, give us light. And um, God, may you continue to bring us through the, this this time that we're going through as a as a community. Uh, God, we lift up all those uh, God uh, those those needs that are close to our heart right now, and we celebrate God with uh, Garrett and Elisa with their marriage yesterday. God, we thank you and celebrate with the whole Conger family. Uh, God, it's just for how uh, you've brought those two together, and and God strengthen them in your love. Uh, give them your peace and your grace and your joy as they start a new life together. Shape us and transform us by your grace that we may grow in wisdom and in confidence, never faltering until we have done all that you desire to bring your realm of shalom to fulfillment. Amen. Kids, we're now going to go to Kids Sermon. And it is spring is is quickly approaching. Uh, it's just a couple weeks around the corner and it, the weather seems to be turning a bit. Hopefully, it continues to do so. And one of the things I know I do during spring is doing some spring cleaning. And we like to clear out things and, you know, your parents might go through your bedroom. And I know uh, my wife, Kelly, is going through with our kids uh, their bedrooms and getting ready clothes that don't fit them anymore and, and, and beginning that process and toys they don't play with anymore and, and begin to, to clear out things that are no longer needed. Um, we begin to sweep out and dust things that we don't normally dust, and we begin to, uh, then we love as a family to plant a garden, right? We begin to plant. So we clear out, we sweep, we plant. And during spring and during the Lent, I'd encourage you to think about that, uh, not only in your own bedrooms, but in your own life. What are things that you need to clear out of your life? What are, uh, maybe it's you eat too much candy, maybe it's you um, are too mean to your brother or sister, uh, what do you need to, to, to sweep out, to clear out? And then what do you need, seeds do you need to plant? Um, maybe uh, I would encourage you to, to ask your parent about starting some sort of garden to plant, to see a seed grow. Um, and I encourage you parents at home maybe to get like a little uh, see-through cup that you can plant a seed in and so your kids can see uh, how seeds grow and, and, and sprout and bring fruit and enjoy the fruit of their labor. But what can you, and I, maybe your parents could drop this in the feed, uh, is what can you kids do uh, to help you, uh, plant seeds, to bring good fruit, uh, which means to do something good for your family. What's something you can do good to help out around the house? So this spring, I'd encourage you to do that. Think about things that you could stop doing and things you can, do, you, you can begin to do uh, to help plant seeds of great joy. Uh, around your home. And so let, we always uh, need Jesus to help us in those areas. And so let us pray uh, Jesus' prayer together. The Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. Let us now recite the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God the Father, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into Hades. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven 
and is sitteth on the right hands of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. pray for this morning's offering. Uh, as we do every week, we want to bless those who have given and those uh, gifts that are given. And so uh, you can give online or you can mail your check in, or I know some of you drop those checks off during the week. Uh, please continue, to, continue to, to keep supporting us here at St. Paul's. We truly do appreciate all that you've given and we pray a blessing upon you. So let us now go before God in prayer. God, we thank you for each gift that you've given. God, we thank you for um, how you've blessed us and we're able to give abundantly back to you. God, may uh, you take those gifts. May you expand your kingdom through them. May we continue to see uh, your people multiplied and God bring a reward and a blessing back to those who have given God, whether it be spiritual or it be practical. God, may they, they see a benefit of walking in you and giving. And so God, may we see your kingdom come here in Milltown as it is in heaven through these gifts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us sing the doxology together. chapter 2, verses 13 through 22. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove them all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves he said, Get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it is written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then responded to him, What sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you're going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. And after he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scriptures and the words that Jesus had spoken. Thank you, Frank. We're now going to go to our sermon, and it's the third week of Lent in our series that we're looking at, the Subversive Jesus. Um, this week is a dramatic, uh, you could even say, um, the most subversive act Jesus did um, outside of him entering into death um, and that, the whole process of Good Friday and obviously... Easter Sunday, uh, but this act, and we'll get into it and dive deeper, uh, points to that in a dramatic way. Um, and ultimately, I believe uh, this act is what ultimately got him killed. Uh, so very subversive. Uh, if you're going to resist the power structures around you um, in the way that Jesus did, it's going to cause problems. And so Jesus... The title of my sermon today is Jesus Deconstructs Religious Systems. Um, the word deconstruction, I think, is important as we follow Jesus, as we, as we walk in his ways. Um, 
Another word that's used in scripture is sanctification. Uh, we, you know, the process of becoming like Jesus. And the process of becoming like Jesus takes some deconstruction. It, and, and so it deconstructs what we previously thought. Um, and the Apostle Paul talks about that, this idea of putting aside childish thinking. When I was a child, I thought like a child, I acted like a child. And then as we grow and mature in our faith, uh, we're going to de deconstruct some of those childish and childhood belief systems uh, to become more like Jesus. And and I think it's an ongoing process. I, my, and my journey and my faith journey uh, has been one of deconstruction throughout. Uh, God is always changing me and growing me and deconstructing belief systems that I thought uh, were very important and, and I find later they aren't. But one thing that remains the same is Jesus, right? Um, and he's the center of our faith. He's the foundation. Uh, you know, it's talked about a lot in Scripture. Jesus Christ is the corner stone of our faith. We dig our roots into Jesus. So the story we have, Jesus throwing tables in the temple, uh, creating a ruckus in the temple, uh, telling them that he's going to destroy the temple in three days and then rise it, or in three days it's going to be built again. And so just a little background on this, um, you know, this is around, this is at Passover. And so thousands of people are coming from all over Israel to uh, partake in the sacrificial system, to uh, sacrifice uh, different animals, to enter into the presence of God. If you could think about um, it this way, kind of like if you think about uh, multiple circles, uh, if you look here, draw it for you. There's, um, there you go, multiple circles to enter into the, if the center is the presence of God, the Holy of Holies, and each step of the way to enter into the Holy of Holies, they would um, have to make sacrifices to enter in, and only the high priest could actually enter into the center, and he would uh, sacrifice at the end of the Passover feast the um, Paschal Lamb. And obviously then we know, as, as we'll get into Holy Week, that Jesus becomes that ultimate sacrifice. And so there's no longer a need for any of these sacrifices to enter into the presence of God. And, and um, it's a whole other topic for another day, but as you study the scriptures and see and study God and Jesus and what he said, that it was never intended to be that way to begin with. <laughs> But we humans like to create these structures and these rules to follow these procedures to uh, enter into something beautiful, something um, holy. And so faith at this time was about following the rules. I don't know if you've been in a, a part of a faith a religion uh, organization that you felt to be accepted, to be seen as holy or righteous, that you had to follow a set of rules. And so faith at this time was all about following the rules. Um, and, and so um, also at this time, um, icons, religious icons were physical things. They were built things. They were things you could tangibly touch. Um, and so that was important. There was a lot of sacred things. And then the temple had become a business. Um, they it had become a robust business. And so... Uh, they counted on folks coming into Jerusalem to probably the bulk of their budget for the entire year was built around Passover sacrificial uh, economy. And so here's Jesus destroying this economy. Jesus is um, literally destroying the tables they're selling it on. Um, in, in other uh, background texts about this te passage, if you do some research, you find that Jesus is actually preventing people from entering into this area of the Temple Mount uh, to buy and actually shut it down um, as we headed to Passover. Like he he stopped the entire uh, business of of the buying of of sacrificial lambs. This text uh, is mentioned elsewhere. Actually, all. All four Gospels uh, talk about this story, so it's, it's, it's obviously very important. Um, the other three 
they call them the synoptic gospels. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called um, the synoptics. And so in the synoptic gospels, they um, were recalling and reenacting uh, the, temp- the destruction of the temple that was to come. It was a prophetic prophecy. Um, and so they were asking the same question John was, what will you do if there's no physical temple? What will happen? I think that's a relevant question for us today. Like those of you worshiping on online uh, aren't able to come to our temple, our sanctuary, our church building. And so we at St. Paul's and the church uh, across the world has had to figure out how do we still be the body of Christ, worship together, serve together without uh, being able to actually meet together um, in broad sweeping strokes in big groups. And um, obviously technology has allowed us to uh, have a solution, have an answer for that. But it's a question that we should always ask is what will we do if there was no physical space for us to meet? Would we still be the church? Would we still be uh, St. Paul's? Um, it's an important question to ask. Yes, we would. What would that look like? It would look probably look very different. Um, but here in John, we see uh, the same story is being told, we, but we see John, he anticipates, anticipates the sign of Christ's death and resurrection. He's looking towards all, all of John, uh, the book of John is pointing towards, uh, it's a very spiritual metaphor that John's pointing towards of what Jesus is about to enact and do. And so he starts in John chapter 2, he starts with two very important signs. Uh, the, the sign right before the one that we read this morning is the sign of Jesus turning the water into wine, which is every wine drinker's favorite miracle, right? We, we love that about Jesus. We love that uh, he opened it up with a party. Um, his first miracle uh, was to keep the party going. And that's an important sign, actually. Um, John starts uh, his book, with his most important sign, that this is what's to come. This is the kingdom to come. This was the purpose uh, of Jesus is enacting, that uh, this, this, this wedding feast of, for all of eternity is to come. Uh, we just celebrated a wedding yesterday with the Conger family. And it, it was an exciting time, just this feast. And you've been to a wedding feast before, uh, I'm sure you, you, you can taste and see, and, and those are moments that you just don't want to leave, you, you want to enjoy. Um, and so, that, so John starts uh, his signs by, this is what's to come, the kingdom of God is like, God will transform. Cana was the beginning of the signs, it was about the kingdom, it was a wedding feast of, uh, at, at feasts like this, there, there's unity, right? There's love, there's care. When we're sharing a meal together like that in a huge feast, there's, there is a provision provided for us, there, right? There's nourishment towards us. Uh, there, there's never lacking. And the story of the wedding at Cana uh, was clear that they will never be lacking on the good stuff. But also, Jesus, he turns water into wine, right, at this ceremony. And we, um, and, and this water... Uh, there's a lot going on here. He, he took, he used six of the ceremonial stone jars. And these ceremonial stone jars were used for, for hand cleansing to, to show a sign and symbol that they wanted to remain pure. This is an important Jewish uh, symbol. This is an important Jewish icon. Um, it was a huge religious icon. Uh, it might be similar to uh, how some of us view uh, the baptismal font, or uh, how some of us view uh, the the cup uh, of the communion table, and Jesus takes that uh, that religious icon and he desecrates it. He takes that pure water and turns it into pure wine. Jesus is saying in his first miracle that uh, I have come to establish a a new kingdom, a new kingdom built on love, of of unity, of togetherness, of provision, of of fellowship, of fun, of, of joy. 
um, from a religion built on rules and regulations and you have to do something to gain purity that no you're just welcome and pure by declaration by the invitation of the king and so there's a process that we go through that our lives have to go from water to wine to experience the kingdom of God. I think that's the sign that John is telling us here. And then he immediately goes into the second sign. If the first sign is the kingdom to come, uh, the kingdom that will come, but it takes us to transform from water into wine, to, to step away from the religious activity into what Christ has said, that, that, that Christ transforms. Like uh, I love that it was a purity uh, cleansing uh, dish water that was used because Christ is saying, no, I purify you, right? And then we can draw all sorts of signs and symbolisms to uh, the, the cup of the, of the covenant, the, the wine uh, that represents Christ's blood, that his blood spilt for us is what transforms us and allows us to enter into the kingdom of God, that Christ does it, that it's not about our activity that does it, but Christ and what he's done for us that does it. And this is what Jesus is saying. He's desecrating religion. He is deconstructing religion. He says it's not about religion. It's not about your religious activity, but it's about Jesus. So that's the first sign of the kingdom to come. And that's the whole, uh, that's what the whole story is built on. This is what is coming. And so the second sign, the sign that was read for us today, um, is that Jesus wants to turn our water into wine. It's how Jesus does it. That we are actually, I'm going to bury the lead here, that we are the icon. We are the icons. We are the religious symbols of the Holy God. We are the temple of God. So Jesus says in the text, that zeal for my father's house will consume me. You see, this zeal for the right way to, to live, the right way to follow God, the right way to have faith, uh, is what got Jesus kill, killed. Jesus standing, uh, I, I kind of picture as I think about uh, this scene, this would have been kind of the entryway to the whole Temple Mount, and Jesus is literally standing in the doorway blocking people from entering into this, this uh, if you will, village, uh, Passover village to buy the lambs, to buy the, the doves, to buy, to buy what they needed for their sacrifices. And Jesus is standing uh, as, as they would enter into this Temple Mount through these doorways. He's standing at the doorway preventing people from entering in. Because he was saying it's not about religion. It's not about this. It's not about sacrifice. And so this zeal consumed him. And we'll remember that on Good Friday. This zeal for his father's house, his, this, this true faith, this true kingdom of God, this, this new way of living, this revolution is what got Jesus killed. And so uh, as we look at the scriptures, as we look at what Jesus is saying here, and as we you know, see the veil being torn when, when Christ was crucified, we, we, are, we learn and we know and the disciples, it says here in a text that they remembered later what Jesus had told them, that, that, our, that our lives are the temple of God. Our bodies are... God's temple. And so Jesus here is attacking the whole basis for religion. If you no longer have to enter into this temple mount, you no longer have to buy all these things for uh, sacrifice to enter into the presence of God, if you actually physically are received and have the presence of God already in you, that you are the holy of holies, that you are the holy place, that that the ground that you walk on is holy ground, that defeats everything that they had established and set up. So you can see how the religious elite would be upset about this. Jesus is threatening not only their way of life, he's threatening their, their careers, he's threatening their homes, their, their, how they provide for their families, their, their power. Right, Jesus is attacking their power. This is uh, what angered them to their core. Because then people don't have to go and, 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 and present themselves before a priest. The, the, the high priest realized he wasn't the only one that got to enter into the presence of God, that everyone got to. 
And so Jesus is just attacking this whole basis for religion. Jesus puts to death religion. He, he healed on the Sabbath. He attacked icons of the faith. He broke the rules and showed it's about love, grace, and inclusion. The story in John 9, and so John, the book of John, just kind of builds on this, these first two signs and shows how Jesus is, is deconstructing religion in all sorts of different ways. He's attacking some of their most sacred. Uh, I mean, in this moment, he's attacking their most sacred thing, the temple, right? It, it, in antiquity at this time, in, this, in history, it was one of the seven wonders of the world, this temple mount, what they had built. And Jesus is attacking the whole system. He is deconstructing everything. He's telling people that it's not about this. You thought you had it figured out, but guess what? It's not about this. And so in John 9, at the healing of Siloam, he, he, he heals someone on Sabbath and he does this over and over. He heals on the Sabbath. He does work on the Sabbath where he's not supposed to. But he has this guy go wash in, 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 a, in the pool that the high priest would wash in before he entered into the Holy of Holies. It was a complete slap in the face of what Jesus did. He was deconstructing religion constantly. And so the message for us today is that we humans are image bearers of the divine. We are the icons. You are an icon of Jesus. You are an image bearer of the Holy One. So you... We, as humans, meet God in the flesh through our image bearings. We, we meet with God. He is with us. It says in the scriptures that he, we, we receive the breath of God. It's, it's every breath that we take is the divine. Our, the divine's presence is constantly around us. It's in us. It works through us. And we've been given the ability to manifest all the principles of the kingdom that is on display and at a wedding feast, the, the principles of love, the, uh, the relationship that's there, the unity, the inclusion, the provision. We, we have what it takes to manifest that to the world. And so our water to wine story, our, our lives being transformed from water into to this holy wine is us recognizing that we are God's temple that we are a new people, that we are the flesh of Christ. We are the body of Christ, Paul tells us. We are a people of faith who are being transformed. We are a transformed and transfigured people. And so the ground in which you walk on is holy ground. The, gra the, the, the places that you go where you, where you are standing is holy ground. You are a holy people. You are a priesthood of all believers. You are a priest with every right to have access to the divine as anyone else. This is what Jesus came to deconstruct, that you have access to the divine. You don't need to come through me as your pastor. There is, there is no special uh, knowledge that I have that, or access that you don't already have. This altar is no more holy than you are. In fact, you are more holy than this altar. You are more holy than the cross hanging on the wall. That's what Jesus is telling us. That this building is not the church, that you are the church. We get it all mixed up that I'm going to church. No, you are the church. I'm going to be with the church is a better way to put it. This is just a building where the church meets and gathers together, but you are the church. You are the temple of God. You are where God dwells. There's nothing special about this building other than the beautiful windows. This is a beautiful building. Don't get me wrong. It creates a great environment to enter into the presence of God with his people, but you have access. You don't have to step foot in this building to have access to Jesus. He is with you. And so the temple is seen as a place where heaven and earth come together. That's why it was seen as so holy and sacred. And that's why sacrifices were made and rituals were followed to enter into the presence of God. And, but because they truly believed in, in, in Scripture, that's what they it said, that at, in the, at the altar of God, at, in the temple of God, that's where heaven meets earth. And, and you are where heaven meets earth. Think about that. It's a humbling thing to think about. 
that heaven comes to earth in you through the divine. The divine lives in you. You are the, you are the temple of God. You are that holy place. So Jesus was saying that heaven meets earth in us, in everyone. There is nothing special about going to the Temple Mount. If there's nothing special about going to the Temple Mount, it destroys and deconstructs their whole faith religion. And that's ultimately what got Jesus killed. And so Jesus' message of love, of radically accepting others, of inclusion, of embracing others, of of loving others. It's too great to be contained in the old ways of religion. And it's interesting, Jesus did this and, and Christianity was started. In the early days, uh, they lived out this water to the wine faith. They lived out this transformed faith. They lived out this, um, we, are, we are holy we don't have we so we can worship anywhere because where the church is, there is God. It says in the, in God's word, Jesus says, "Where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am also." So when we are gathered together as a church, we are on holy ground. We are in sacred space. Jesus also destroyed this idea that there's some space that's sacred and there's some space that's secular. Uh, he destroyed that whole idea where wherever. God's people are there. There is holy ground and God's people are everywhere. He, he eliminates that. That it's all sacred. That everywhere we go and step and move and breathe is sacred. That his kingdom is here and now, but yet not fully cons- consumed, right? Consummated. That, that we haven't yet experienced that full great wedding feast, but we can taste it at moments now. And we can see it throughout our world. That's what Christ launched and inaugurated on his resurrection Sunday. And Jesus is saying it's all, it's all one. There's, there's no more coming to temple, coming to, to the altar, to the sanctuary, uh, to, to, to enter into God's presence. You can enter into God's presence at any time. And so we, for some reason, have gotten away from that. And it, it, it's human nature to go back to the old way. Why? Because certain people want power. They want to domineer they want you to think they need you that you need them for some special knowledge and so sin enters a church just like any other organization on earth and so throughout church history we can see and it's not just uh it's not just one faith tradition i know many of us uh, that gather here at St. Paul's have a tradition of, of a Catholic background. But whether you're Catholic, whether you're Protestant, whether you're Orthodox, whether you're Baptist, whether you're Evangelical, whatever your background is, we, we all have that religious uh, hold on our hearts that Jesus wants to deconstruct today. We all have that thing that we were told as a child, as we were growing up in the faith by, by someone who we felt was more important and knew God better than us, that if, if we didn't do this thing that, that we would burn in hell or that we would be in trouble, we, we, would, we would suffer consequences and we, we have this fear. We, and if we have any faith and religion background, many of us, I, not all, maybe some of us grew up in a great environment, we don't have some of that baggage, but many of us do because it's human nature to go back to that that we have to do something. And so no longer are sacrifices today like pigeons and, and lambs and, and ducks or, or what have you. Uh, but sacrifices might be, I have to give a certain percentage of my income to the church or I'm going to be in trouble. If you're from an evangelical background, that was, is definitely drilled into your head. That you, that you go to hell. If you don't pray a prayer the right way, if you don't say... Uh, the right words, you, you would lose your salvation. If you don't go to church enough, if you don't show up to the holy obligation uh, moments, if you, if you take communion the wrong way, if you um, step in the wrong place at the wrong time, in the wrong building, or if you're not baptized a certain way, or if you don't believe certain things about Jesus, the right doctrines, then uh, you're in trouble. And the list goes on and on and on. And here's Jesus saying, it's not about that. 
It's about us trusting Jesus to transform our lives from water into wine, into that holy line, to recognize that that the divine lives in us, that we have complete assets to him, that he gives us love, he gives us grace, he gives us forgiveness, he gives us peace. And so today, what do you need to transform? What does What needs transforming in your life? What needs crucifying? Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I live, but Christ that lives in me. We crucify those things in our heart. We crucify the religious activity. We crucify that idea that I have to do these things to gain favor from God. That is is the opposite of what Jesus wants from you. Christ wants us to recognize that religious activity is not the way to him. The way to him is actually putting to death those activities so that we might so that Christ might live in us. You are Christ's temple. You are sacred and holy. So let us deconstruct some of that religion in our lives today. Let us go to the table and receive his grace, his love, his forgiveness. This table is a taste of the kingdom to come. As at that wedding banquet, there's unity at the table, there's provision, there's uh, love, there's grace, all are welcome. There's more, there's better wine. It's at the table that transformation happens as we're with Christ. And so I'd invite you to take out your elements. If you don't have them, maybe press pause on this video and and, uh, grab some and join us at, at Christ's table to receive his love, his grace, his forgiveness, his freedom. Um, and you're not bound by this act. So if you don't do it, that's okay. Um, but we do it because we want to receive that presence. We believe Christ is present at his table, that he invites us to receive the spiritual nourishment. To, as we partake, there's something about eating and, and drinking that we remember that, that Christ did it all for us, that we don't have to do religious activity to receive his grace and forgiveness, that he gave us his life. He came and became human and showed us that we are the temple of God. And so as we take the bread, it's a reminder that we are God's temple. And then he took the cup of the new covenant and he shed his blood for the forgiveness of sins that no longer do we have to feel like we need to sacrifice to enter into God's presence. It's free. It's always been free. But Jesus entered into death so that we might live So let us remember that now through the elements. Let us go uh, to our confession and then we will partake together. Most merciful God, we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we've left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry. We humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us. It's by Christ's shed blood that you are forgiven today. Receive and take that forgiveness and go live that forgiveness in your world. Give and and live as as grace-filled people. Let us pray for the elements and we'll partake together. Night Jesus, we trade. He took the bread, he broke it. He said, this is my body given for you. Take and eat. Receive his life. Receive his freedom from religion. The same token, he took the cup of the new covenant. He knew we'd go back to the old ways. He knew we'd go back to making up new sacrifices, new way of enacting religion. And he shed his blood to forgive even those who who are high and mighty on their religious high horses, that he forgives us when we think we have to do something to gain his favor. He forgives and he invites us continually to his table, to his great wedding feast. We look forward to that ultimate wedding feast one day. So let us pray. God, thank you for coming in in flesh as Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice. Thank you for giving us your spirit. Empower us today to go live and be people of grace and peace and hope and joy, inclusion of love. And God, may we not pursue religion any longer, but just pursue holy you. May we recognize we're people who are standing on holy ground wherever we go. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us take together. Join me in singing a closing hymn. How great thou art.